Why the 900 pound gorilla, is it a gorilla or an elephant in the corner of the room? <laughs> it's never mentioned the enormous expenditure, six cents of every dollar now that the federal, that the Congress allocates every year for the Pentagon, six cents of every dollar while two cents goes for schools and three cents for health care. That's never mentioned as a cause of the deficit. And we know the reason for the silence that people don't know these facts, and that's the complicit, complacent, and corporate-controlled media who are not in the least bit interested in an informed and educated populace. It's a huge problem. We know it every time we turn on the TV. To break through that curtain of distortion and falsehoods and intentional silence that is so pervasive, we must seek out other sources of information. We can look to the internet, we can look to our cherished independent sources of information that are not married to uh, corporate cash. And it's in that context that I am so proud to be able to introduce today's guest speaker. Jerry Scale, I've been doing that for a week, by the way, is an investigative journalist and author whose book focuses on the use of private military companies, so-called private contractors. He is the author of the best-selling book, Blackwater, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army which was the winner of a George Polk Book Award. He also serves as correspondent for the radio and TV program Democracy Now, David, <laughs> which many of us know and cherish and depend upon as an alternate source of information. <laughs> for Democracy Now. And um, Scannell is also a Puppin Foundation Writing Fellow at the Nation Institute and a frequent contributor to the nation. And so, dear brothers and sisters, Give a warm and loud welcome to Jeremy Stanley. Well, I can't believe how many people are actually inside when it's a beautiful day out, so thank you for making that sacrifice to, to come in here today. Um, and thank you to all of the activists that made this gathering possible and who are constantly representing Brooklyn in a very strong way and pushing for a peace agenda. Uh, it's a, a very much an uphill battle, um, but it, if, if it's to be won, it's, it's in small communities across this country and groups like this that gather together and, and, and refuse uh, to be a part of, of a war machine that is increasingly being unleashed um, in countries away from media attention and anything even vaguely resembling effective congressional oversight. Um, I, uh, I've spent pretty much the past decade traveling in and out of uh, U.S. war zones. I, I started going to Iraq in the, uh, the mid-1990s, uh, and after 9-11, um, at the time I, I was living in, uh, in Belgrade, uh, at the time the country was called Yugoslavia, uh, now it's Serbia, um, I was living in, in, in Belgrade because I had been covering uh, the downfall of the regime of Slobodan Milosevic and the, the NATO war, the U.S.-led NATO war uh, in the Serbian province of Kosovo. And when 9-11 happened, I was in Belgrade, and I, I remember uh, thinking as I, I watched the, the towers falling um, and then the, the, the Pentagon burning, uh, that they were going to attack Iraq. And it, it wasn't some Nostradamus uh, prediction on my part. It, it was pretty clear to people who had been paying attention uh, to the agenda of, of uh, the neocons throughout the 1990s that they were agitating for regime change in Iraq. Uh, in fact, they, they came into power. Uh, people like Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld and, and Douglas Fife and Paul Wolfowitz and Stephen Cambone. These guys spent the entire duration of the 90s in the, in the parallel government in this country. When Bill Clinton was in power, uh, they were running a sort of shadow government that was preparing for the next time that they would uh, come into power at the White House. And they were at the think tanks, or as Naomi Klein says, the, the people paid, by, paid to think by the makers of tanks. Uh, so they're at, they're at these think tanks, and of course Dick Cheney, uh, for, for part of the 1990s, was building up the Halliburton Empire, which was particularly interesting because Cheney, when he was Defense Secretary under George H.W. Bush, one of the last things he did as Defense Secretary was to commission a study from a division of Halliburton on how to privatize as much of the military bureaucracy as possible. And the, the idea, uh, and it was, it was quite brilliant on Cheney's part, was that you, you can kind of get a two for one. When you outsource as much of the military bureaucracy as possible, you free up uh, more of the, the men and women in uniform to do the fighting of your wars, and it enables you to fight more wars, small and large, uh, simultaneously. Um, but it also creates an incredible pool of U.S. taxpayer-funded payoffs uh, to huge corporations. 
And those corporations, in turn, will then take some of their profits and pour them back into the U.S. campaign finance machine, which is essentially a, a corporate ATM that is uh, funded by U.S. taxpayers. And there's a direct relationship between the wars that we've seen waged throughout these uh, decades, really, but certainly over the past 10 years, and the campaign finance system in this country. Uh, many of the Democrats are completely bought by the defense industry. The, and I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a misnomer. I mean, it's, there's nothing defensive about it. We have an offensive <laughs> war machine. Uh, we almost never have taken a defensive action. We're all in the business now of preemptive war uh, and, and, and these so-called signature strikes, which is, which is an insane name for, for a, a process of choosing targets for drones in Pakistan and, and now in Yemen, uh, where you are not targeting an individual person. And you're certainly not targeting anyone that's been accused of a crime in any court uh, or, or has been brought up on any charges. But it's not even that we're targeting, uh, that the U.S. is targeting individuals anymore in these surgical strikes. They're doing a pattern of life analysis. And what they're saying is that if, if this person was known to attend this mosque, and then they were at a gathering with a large group of people, and we know that they met with X, Y, and Z over the course of the next 10 years, then it's safe to assume that that person is a terrorist. We don't have any actual evidence on that person, but the CIA is now authorized through drone surveillance to determine patterns of life for individual people or groups of people in Yemen and in Pakistan, and then determine that those people are legitimate military targets to be taken out. And those kinds of strikes are called signature strikes. Uh, rather than the sort of high-value target intentional strike where you're trying to hit an individual person. That's how far it's come. And, and you see, not, you hear not a peep from anyone in the Congress. You know, Dennis Kucinich, who uh, you know, is, is of course no longer going to be serving in Congress, Either they redistricted him, and then he was forced into a, a, a showdown with Marcy Kaptur, who's a relatively progressive member of Congress. She's certainly not Dennis Kucinich, um, but she's been very good on some of these issues. Uh, but they, they basically force these, these two people who on, on war issues are generally on the left side of the spectrum to fight against each other, and Dennis Kucinich gets pushed out. A lot of people sort of try to cartoonize Dennis Kucinich and, 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 and make fun of him, and, and, uh, and you know, he runs for president, and he's up, up there on the stage, and people sort of tried to act like he was a joke. Dennis Kucinich was one of the most serious lawmakers in Washington. And I'm not sure how many of you know this, but when it was first revealed in early 2010, that the United States government was maintaining a hit list that included U.S. citizens. Okay. Dennis Kucinich introduced a bill in the Congress, and that bill did not mention the name Anwar al -Laki. It didn't mention any specific names. It simply said that as a result of these news reports, that the United States government, the CIA, and the Joint Special Operations Command are operating some sort of a hit list that might include U.S. citizens. The Congress should clarify uh, the law for the president. And, and what that resolution, it was just one page long, what it simply said was, the United States government does not have a right to assassinate its own citizens without due process. It seems simple enough. It seems consistent with the values I would imagine a majority of Americans believe that they hold and that this country is supposed to represent. Six members of the House signed on to that bill with Dennis Kucinich, and not a single senator. This was not a pro Anwar al laki bill. This had, it didn't mention anything about Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. It didn't talk about terrorists. It simply clarified that U.S. citizens cannot be assassinated by their own government without due process. And only six members of Congress would sign on to this with Congressman Dennis Kucinich. So with, with him out of Congress, the, the, the number of people that are the elected representatives of the people of this nation that actually will stand up for, for a sharp, clear peace agenda is, is almost non-existent right now. Remember how all of this started in the modern context. I and mean, we can talk about the whole history of the United States and it's completely uh, riddled by uh, episodes of mass violence and genocide um, and, and collective punishment and the prison industrial complex and, the, the, and slavery and the, the targeting of Native Americans. But I'm gonna confine my, my conversation on, uh, on, on, on these wars to basically the past 12 years. Remember, though, how it got so far that, that in September and October of last year, in a two-week period, three United States citizens were killed in drone strikes directly authorized by President Barack Obama. 
wow. in a two-week period. Not a single one of those three American citizens was charged with any crime in a U.S. court. They were well known to the United States government. There were a lot of allegations being made against them. Some of them, in the case of Anwar al laki did the U.S. government a favor in, in terms of some of the rhetoric uh, that, that he was engaging in on YouTube and elsewhere. Uh, but the rhetoric that Anwar al laki was engaging in is no more radical than what we hear white supremacist groups engage in in the United States all the time, including in threatening directly the President of the United States. And yet, somehow, we as a nation have elected people who believe that secret lists for people that just need to die are acceptable. That, that, that we don't have to, to, to try our own citizens to give them the death penalty. That the President of the United States, and his, that's the real death panel. The Republicans like to talk about death panels. There is a death panel, but it's, it's, it's not about health care. The death panel is about killing American citizens with no due process whatsoever. So in this two week period, the President of the United States served as prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner against three U.S. citizens. And there has been almost no outrage expressed from that, expressed over those deaths whatsoever. Instead, you see a, a, an avalanche of people talking about how they deserved it. Harry Reid was on the, you know, who's the Senate Majority Leader, the leading Democrat. Harry Reid, three weeks ago, was on CNN. And Candy Crowley, the anchor on CNN, asked Harry Reid what he thought about these three U.S. citizens that had been killed in Yemen. And he said he wasn't going to get into classified information, but that those three people were terrorists who deserved to die. Now, you can make a case that Anwar al laki was espousing uh, views that, that encouraged terrorist activity. That should be dealt with in a U.S. court, if that's the case. If he violated a U.S. law and he's a U.S. citizen, that should be dealt with in a court. I'm not here to defend Anwar al laki's legacy. But how many of you, of you are aware who the third American citizen killed in that strike was. It was a 16-year-old boy named Abdurrahman al laki whose only crime in the world appears to have been that his father was named Anwar al laki He wasn't killed as collateral damage in the same strike as his father. His father was killed with another American citizen named Samir Khan, whose parents were Pakistani immigrants. The two of them were killed in late September. Two weeks later, this boy, Abdurrahman al laki had been uh, in the family's village in Shabwa, in, in Yemen, and he was there to help uh, honor his, his father after he had died, and he was sitting with his 17-year-old cousin in an outdoor restaurant, and they were eating, and a drone came and fired a missile directly, hitting the restaurant where these teenage boys and others were eating dinner. The United States government has not given any explanation Abdurrahman al laki was killed 198 days ago. The U.S. government has provided no explanation for why that teenage American citizen was assassinated in a U.S. drone strike authorized by the President of the United States. Originally they tried to say that there was a terrorist that he was with named Ibrahim Albana and that he was the target. They were, of course they don't say this publicly, they leak it to the Washington Post, which is, which is basically the, the receiving uh, vehicle for CIA propaganda. So they leak this to the Washington Post and they say, well, he was collateral damage, we were trying to kill Ibrahim Albana, but the real question is what was he doing with Ibrahim Albana? Ibrahim Albana wasn't even there. Ibrahim Albana is still walking around Yemen. So who was the target in that strike that killed a 16-year-old citizen who was born in Colorado in Abdurrahman al laki Where's the call from the State Department to his family to explain to him why this happened? One of the other Americans that was killed, Samir Khan, who I told you about. Samir Khan's crime was that he was the creator and editor, at least according to the, to the press reports, of, a, of a, a pro Al Qaeda publication called Inspire Magazine, which was an English language, glossy, downloadable PDF uh, magazine that published a dozen or so issues. I, I was featured in one of the, one of the issues, so I mean, I, I, I look forward to my material support uh, conversations. But, so Samir Khan was publishing this magazine, and, and he, they had articles that were like, how, how to make a bomb in your mama's kitchen, and you know, it was, wacky sort of pro-terrorism stuff in there. And then there was also analysis about the world and about U.S. drone strikes, and it was a propaganda magazine, basically. But Samir Khan, I just met with Samir Khan's family. Samir Khan's family 
started getting visits from the FBI in 2007 because Samir Khan, when he was still living in the US, was a blogger who was blogging against the wars. He was deeply affected by Abu Ghraib and the torture at Abu Ghraib. And he started blogging. And you can still go back and see, it's online, it's archived. He, like many people in this country, and not just Muslims, or not, and not just Arabs, but like many people in this country, were outraged at these wars, the seeming endless nature of them, and the extent to which the US intelligence and military community would go to test new techni techniques of torture on, on people in secret prisons around the world and in known prisons in Iraq and Afghanistan. So Samir Khan then goes to Yemen uh, to study Arabic, and he somehow gets involved with Anwar al -Laki. The FBI visits the Khan family, and they said, you know, are you in touch with, with Samir? We're concerned about some of the things that he's writing. We're concerned who he's with in Yemen. But they said repeatedly to the Khans that your, your son has not broken any laws that we know of. And that as far as we can tell, he's engaged in First Amendment protected activities. So Samir Khan is then killed in this US drone strike after multiple visits from the FBI telling his family that he was engaged in First Amendment protected activity, but they were concerned about who he was associating with. He wasn't indicted on any charges. He wasn't charged with any crime, and he's killed. The State Department calls the Khan family after that drone strike, and they said, we regret to inform you that your son has been killed in Yemen. And the family said, well, who, who killed him? Yeah. Said, well, we can't talk about that. So, so here you have three US citizens. One of them they probably could have brought up on charges, Anwar al if if they wanted to. Uh, I haven't seen evidence that has convinced me that he was an operational member of Al-Qaeda, but I can understand that there's enough in the public domain where it warranted an investigation. But, but you don't handle people that you find suspicious by just murdering them or ordering their execution. They're supposed to be uh, due process. So Anwar, I, I interviewed people close to Al-Qaeda when I was just in Yemen. And they said, Al-Laki al wasn't a member of Al-Qaeda. He was a religious leader that we all respected. And he was definitely pro-Al-Qaeda, but he wasn't, he wasn't with us. He wasn't plotting these attacks. He wasn't teaching people how to fire. He looked like a donkey with a spoon when he was holding a rocket-propelled grenade launcher, like the man didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> and yet suddenly, and it came as a great shock to his family and to Al-Qaeda in Yemen, suddenly President Obama, in announcing that he's killed Anwar al laki says that he was the head of external operations for Al-Qaeda. All of a sudden, he goes from being uh, you know, th this, this guy who is a, uh, a, a, an internet jihadist preacher to being the head of external operations for Al-Qaeda. And, and that came as a great shock to Al-Qaeda in Yemen because th that wasn't the leadership structure they had on their, on their internal papers. But the, the reason that I'm bringing all of this up is because if President Bush was doing this, if President Bush was in office or, a president, or if McCain had won, and you had the President of the United States declaring quite openly that he has every right to order the assassination of US citizens with no charges, there would be a hell of a lot more outrage than there is right now. If President Bush was expanding drone attacks into Yemen with that nonsense about signature strikes that you can somehow, from 30,000 feet in the air, develop a pattern of life for people and then decide that they need to die the next day, if President Bush was doing that, there'd be a lot more outrage. There'd be a lot more members of Congress that would be at least making a little bit of noise about it. What we've seen happen over this first term of President Obama is that this president, who was elected on a, on a pledge to radically change the way that the U.S. was operating, that he has actually expanded many of the worst policies implemented by the Cheney presidency. He has expanded the U.S. wars now into Somalia. We have the U.S. involved with regime change in Libya. You have the U.S. continuing to support dictatorships in Bahrain and Yemen. Uh, you have the United States continuing to bomb Pakistan. You have the Joint Special Operations Command and the CIA intensifying their attacks on Yemen. You have the crackdown on journalists and whistleblowers. This president has applied the Espionage Act against whistleblowers more than any president since the early 1900s. Wow. And this is the constitutional law professor. Who are the people that this administration is going after? Who are they targeting? They're targeting people like former CIA agent John Kiriakou, who blew the whistle on waterboarding. He was one of the sources that first started to reveal the extent to which Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had been waterboarded 283 times. 
and, and, and he spoke out about the waterboarding. And you had Thomas Drake at the NSA who spoke out against the warrantless wiretapping that was going on and continues to go on. This administration came to power saying, we have to look forward, not backward. We are not going to prosecute the CIA torturers. Jose Rodriguez, who destroyed the CIA torture tapes, is going to be selling a book and making hundreds of thousands of dollars. He's going to be on 60 Minutes on Sunday night. He walks around a free man while the CIA people who blew the whistle on it are being prosecuted by this administration. The reality is that if you, it sends a message, if you waterboard, we will protect you. But if you blow the whistle on waterboarding, we will prosecute you. That is what's happening. Journalists are being attacked. Surveillance operations are being conducted against journalists. National security letters are being served on internet providers so that journalists' emails and activists' emails and Twitter accounts and, and Facebook accounts, your information, if they have you in their crosshairs, can be handed over to the government and it is against the law for your internet service provider to tell you that they've been served with those papers. They can face five years in prison simply for telling you that the government is now deeply into your email. This is not happening under a Republican administration. This is happening under a Democratic administration. What Barack Obama has done with his presidency is to normalize the unthinkable, to normalize policies that would have outraged and did outrage people in this country when they came to life. And he's normalizing it for millions of liberals in this country. The damage that has been done over the past three years to the movement to try to stop these covert wars, the climate of secrecy, the crackdown on whistleblower, the damage done to those causes has been devastating. It's, it's been like a, a complete swallowing up of the conscience of so many liberals who have somehow decided that it's acceptable in a country that purports to be a democratic society to cede your conscience to a political party or to someone in power I'm not about the business of electoral politics. I'm not here to tell you who to vote for and who not to vote for. But what I do know is that your actual principles, I mean what you believe in, what you're willing to sacrifice for, they're not tested when Dick Cheney is president. They're tested when Barack Obama is president. It was easy to be against Dick Cheney and his policies. It's very difficult to stand up against this administration's policies. And part of why it's difficult is because the alternative to, to Barack Obama is in some ways even more frightening. I mean, Mitt, Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney uh, almost certainly would, 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 uh, would move toward trying to bomb Iran. His advisors on national security include people like Kofor Black, who was the head of the CIA's counterterrorism center, ran the rendition program under Bush, ran the targeted killing program for the CIA under Bush, was, was the guy who said there was a before 9-11 and an after 9-11, and after 9-11 the gloves come off. This is one of Romney's top uh, advisors on national security policy and is a true gangster thug. Um, so I mean, I'm, I'm very clear about what's happening here, but I'm not so much interested in, in, in playing defense and saying, well, maybe we should vote for this guy because the other one would be worse. That, that has to, that's a personal decision all, everyone has to make. What I'm interested in is what are we doing to hold these people accountable? That's more important to me than what we do on election day, and it has much more to do with what kind of country we want to live in. Over the past few years, I've, I've, I've spent my time in Somalia, I was just in Yemen, uh, in Afghanistan, and in Iraq. When I was in Yemen, I, I was in Yemen a, a, about two months ago, um, I, I flew into Sana'a, and the capital of Yemen, and, and then I went down to uh, Aden, uh, and the Gulf of Aden, of course, was the scene of the uh, bombing in 2000 of the, of the USS Cole uh, that, that killed a number of uh, 17, I, I believe it was, uh, sailors on board the USS Cole uh, right off the coast of, uh, of Aden. And that was really when the, when the Al-Qaeda presence in Yemen uh, ended up on the, on the US radar, and over the past 12 years, the U.S. has intensified its military campaign. <laughs> President Obama, when, uh, in, in December of 2009, authorized his first bombing of, of Yemen on December 17, 2009. He ordered a cruise missile attack uh, on this tiny village uh, in the mountains of, of Abiyan province in southern Yemen called Al Majla. And, and the way that it was reported after we hit, the U.S. hit it with cruise missiles and dropped cluster bombs um, on this village was that the Yemeni military had carried out airstrikes. This is how it was reported in the, in the press. 
The Yemeni military carried out airstrikes against an Al Qaeda training facility, and uh, and and so it was. And they said that uh, uh, 34 Al Qaeda operatives were killed in this strike, and 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 it was being celebrated as a major victory. Well, a, an independent Yemeni journalist named Abdullah Al Haider Shaya managed to get into this village of Al Majla right after the strike, and he took pictures of the missiles and the missile parts that were there, and they, they actually said on them, made in the United States. And they were from General Dynamics, and they were huge uh, Tomahawk cruise missile guidance systems. And they were unexploded uh, cluster bombs. In other words, they were weapons that Yemen does not have. And they were clearly identified as being made in the United States. And the US wouldn't comment on it, and, and US officials directed journalists to the Yemeni embassy in Washington, and the Ye Yemeni embassy in Washington said that it was uh, our strike, meaning Yemen's strike. It turns out that 34 Al Qaeda operatives were not killed in that strike, but 44 civilians. One man who was who was was what they call a rehabilitated member of Al Qaeda. He was an older man who had been an Al Qaeda member but went through a rehabilitation program. He was killed. Everyone else that was killed was either a woman, a child, or a male civilian. Uh, I, I I went there myself, and I interviewed survivors of that strike. A woman whose entire family was killed except for one daughter and a severely mentally challenged son. But her entire, seven members of her family were killed. Another man, 17 members of his family were killed, an, an, an old man. This was a poor Bedouin village that had nothing in the world. They didn't have running water, they didn't have plumbing, they were Bedouins that moved around and they had settled for a period in Al Majla. And they were shredded like beef. Their, their bodies, if you, if you see the video, it would make you vomit. You, as one tribal leader told me who was there right after it happened, and I looked at all the photos that they took when I, when I went there, he said, you couldn't tell if it was goat meat or human meat. And, and when, when there, was, there were limbs in trees that had been blown apart. And the, the, when we went there, the bomb parts are still there. This happened in December of 2009. The unexploded cluster bombs are still there. The guidance system for the tomahawks are still there. When the WikiLeaks cables were released, this incident was covered. It was a big problem for the Yemeni government because tribal leaders in Yemen gathered 100,000 people to protest against this strike. And they were demanding answers from the US-backed dictatorship of Ali Abdullah Saleh. We know you didn't do it. You tell us why the Americans did this. Why did they bomb this village of poor Bedouins? And so it was becoming a political problem that the US had to deal with. General David Petraeus is in a, is in a, uh, a, a meeting with uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh. And Ali Abdullah Saleh, the president of Yemen, is saying to General Petraeus, we'll continue this arrangement to lie and say the bombs are ours and not yours. And the deputy prime minister laughs in the meeting with Petraeus, the, de the Yemeni prime, deputy prime minister. He says, I just lied to our parliament and told them that it was our, our bombing. This is what the US is doing in Yemen. When there are these strikes, they say Yemen has killed these Al-Qaeda operatives. Almost always it's a US strike. We talk a lot about drones, and I'm gonna be attending the drone summit in DC this evening. It's so much more than drones. We're using cruise missiles, we're using cluster bombs, we're using Spectre AC-130 gunships that can come in and just mow down people. When I was in Somalia, I traveled with CIA-backed warlords. The CIA has warlords in Somalia who are being paid to hunt down people that are suspected of being Islamist militants or connected to the movement Al-Shabaab, which is, a, which is a, a radical Islamist movement inside of Somalia. When I flew into the airport in Mogadishu, I immediately saw a huge structure that looked to me like a forward operating base in open view at the airport in Mogadishu. And, and within 48 hours, I had confirmed that it was a new CIA base. I spoke to one of the heads of Somalia's intelligence service who liaises with the CIA. They have a training center there where they're training Somali kill capture teams and they're bankrolling warlords who are hunting down people throughout Somalia. When I called the CIA for comment, they confirmed that, that in fact that was a CIA facility and that, and that in fact they were paying these Somali agents. Uh, they were very, very concerned about us publishing that, but they did confirm that it was in fact accurate. I also reported on how the US has a secret prison 
buried in the basement of Somalia's National Security Agency that is staffed by, currently, under President Obama, in total violation of his own executive orders that he issued within days of taking office, when he stood in front of the original uh, Constitution, copy of the Constitution, and talked about the rule of law, and then proceeded to violate it himself. There's a secret prison infested with bedbugs in the basement of Somalia's National Security Agency, where CIA and, and US military intelligence officials and French and British intelligence interrogate people that in some t cases are snatched off the streets of countries other than Somalia and brought to this prison in Somalia. Does this sound familiar? Yeah. Yes. One guy was taken out of the Somali neighborhood of Eastley in Nairobi, Kenya, was hooded, shackled, a diaper placed on him, taken to an airplane, flown from Nairobi into Mogadishu. He only knew he was in Mogadishu because of the smell of the sea. They then take him to a, a bedbug infested prison and repeatedly interrogate him. No Red Cross. When I was on Democracy Now! with the Red Cross, I asked the Red Cross, the head of their uh, Somalia office, about that prison. He said, We've ne we have no information on it. I said, well, are you going to follow up on it? And he goes, we wouldn't, wouldn't know where to even start. I said, we can just go into the airport in Mogadishu and you can walk over to the CIA base and ask them to take you to their prison. Because it's, it's there and everyone knows about it and no one talks about it. And, and, and the CIA tries to pressure journalists not to talk about it. I know for a fact that several famous foreign correspondents knew about that prison before I did, and none of them printed it. And the question is why? This administration has raised the stakes for journalists who go up against U.S. national security policy. They've raised the stakes for people who dare to interview those people that have been called terrorists or labeled terrorists by the United States government. The journalists I told you about who took the pictures of the U.S. missile parts and gave them to Amnesty International and broadcast them on Al Jazeera around the world, he's in a secret prison right now in Yemen. He was prosecuted in a court that was set up to go after journalists who insulted the U.S.-backed regime of Ali Abdullah Saleh. And he has been sentenced to prison for being an Al-Qaeda spokesperson. He worked with ABC News, he worked with the Washington Post, he worked with Al Jazeera. He was one of the most well-known independent journalists in Yemen. And you know why he's in prison right now? Because of one man, Barack Obama. Now you may, you may say, you may say, well how can you connect Obama to this? I'll tell you. On February 2nd, 2010, Barack Obama called Ali Abdullah Saleh. This is on the White House website, the readout of the call and expressed concern about this journalist, Abdullah Haider Shaya. He knew that he had been uh, held by the Yemeni government. He had been picked up multiple times. He was beaten and harassed. And the Yemeni government was going to release him. And Obama calls the president of Yemen and says that the US is very concerned about reports that you intend to pardon and release Abdullah Haider Shaya. And Ali Abdullah Saleh had a pardon on his desk that had been prepared by tribal mediators. He ripped it up. And that journalist remains in prison to this day because of one phone call from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Not from John Brennan, not from Hillary Clinton, from the President of the United States himself. That's how far the war on journalists has come. That we will keep foreign journalists in gulags in their own country. The world is a battlefield is a phrase that the neocons loved. It was on all their PowerPoint presentations. When Congress gave them the authority uh, to wage war around the world, we crossed a, a threshold in this country. The designation of people as terrorists is done by fiat, not by evidence, not through due pro anything resembling due process. Every country in the world is subject to potential action by the United States Military Special Operations Forces or by the CIA's Special Activities Division. If there's a person that we've identified as a terrorist, that we decide needs to die, we have a drone to do it, or we can simply bomb their village with a, a cruise missile. The fact is that this president has doubled down on the very dangerous notion that the world is a battlefield, and that anyone we don't like, including those people that are our own citizens whose speech we don't like, that they have somehow have a missile with their name on it, rather than an indictment with their name on it. The, 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 it's the constitutional law expert that has taken us to a point now where it is codified as U.S. policy that Democrats and Republicans alike believe in assassination as a central part of the American identity when it comes to foreign policy. How incredibly dangerous the moment we're in now actually is. And it's, it's, it's people like you who, who have the audacity to say no in a culture of yes that are going to change this country. It's not about electoral politics. It's, it's, it's about 
preserving our own conscience and trying to spread these movements for peace and justice, regardless of if the person in power is someone we like or someone we despise. Mm -hmm. These are times that try your principles. Rise to the occasion. Thank you very much. The next workshop is about to begin. Okay, so let's say 10 minutes for questions and answers and make it brief, please. And they're not statements, really, they're questions, okay? Um, yes? Considering what you said about that Yemen Bedouin village, what was the reason for the bombing? I will. I will. She said that considering the, the, uh, the strike on the village in Yemen, what was the reason for the bombing? Um, there's, there's a pattern that's emerged um, since uh, mid-2009 where the, the U.S. Had, there's almost a dearth of intelligence. Uh, the U.S. has very few ground assets in Yemen and relies almost entirely on the Yemeni government or the Saudis to provide intelligence. And what's, what's happened is that in a number of cases, the Yemeni government has provided intelligence to the U.S., to the CIA, or to the, uh, the Joint Special Operations Command, identifying uh, a group of people as terrorists that they know the United States is looking for. Um, and, and, and what has actually been the case is that the, the regime in Yemen has been giving coordinates of its political opponents, tribal leaders that have, have spoken up against it. So it's sort of death by America. And in fact, we, we see this a lot in, in Afghanistan, too, where many night raids um, are, are, are actually the result of bad intelligence given to the Americans by people that are trying to settle a score with, with neighbors or with their enemies. So they'll go, they'll, on three different days, they'll send three different people from their tribe or their clan to go and meet with the Americans and say, well, there's Taliban bomb makers in this house. And then the place gets raided, and it turns out it was someone that stole goats from someone else like 10 years ago. And it, I mean, it happens repeatedly. There are three cases that I'm, I'm investigating right now where that, that, that's literally the case. So some of it is, is bad intelligence. Um, some of it is, is the case that maybe there are two or three people that the U.S. is targeting and there's been a determination made that even though there are 30 other people there, um, it's, it's worth the collateral damage to kill those people because we don't know if we'll have another chance to, to strike them. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that those are the two most common reasons when the, the high civilian death toll takes place is either bad intelligence um, or that a, de a determination has been made that the, the killing of the, of, of the individual is more important than the than the fallout or the blowback from the, the so-called collateral damage in those, those strikes. Yeah. Um, that um, U.S. Marine sergeant that went in and killed uh, um, so basically the, the whole house, uh, women and children. Uh, what are the chances of that being? Um, uh, he went crazy, or right. it's been done before, or he's done it before. So the question is about was about this uh, because a lot of Sergeant Bales, who's alleged to have, have massacred. I'll get you, man. You don't have to forget. Uh, alleged to have massacred all of these. Uh, I forget exactly. I was 17, I believe it was. Um, Afghan civilians, some of whom were apparently shot execution style. Um, you know, I, I I don't know the facts of that case. Um, I, I don't I don't want to give you a non-answer. I don't mean that particular case, but is it kind of is it common that this has been done before as Look, policy? I, I, I'm aware, I've seen photos from, from the years when I, that I spent working on Blackwater. Wives of Blackwater guys at times, year, this was years ago, uh, would send me photos that their husbands had taken or their boyfriends had taken um, in Iraq or Afghanistan um, where they were, they were chopping heads off of people. Uh, there were these, this kill team in Afghanistan chopped the fingers off. One of the guys wore a necklace with, with the, the pinky bone of someone that he had killed. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a twisted mentality uh, that takes place in some of these places where uh, guys go nuts or they become really sadistic, murderous people. And, um, and, and I don't know what happened in that case, but. Um, you know, Chris Hedges, my colleague at The Nation, um, wrote a book years ago that was largely based on interviews with soldiers, and, and Chris did a brilliant job of talking about the difference between killing and murder. 
Um, and, and what we're seeing in, you know, in these cases appears to be murder, where you're actually going, seeking out someone to go and kill, and you're intentionally doing it, you're murdering them. It's not like you're in a firefight, but you're, you're murdering. And that's, it's sick, and it's, I think it, it's happening a lot, and it's also a lot, there's a lot of domestic violence against women from a lot of these guys coming back and not getting adequate <coughs> mental health care. Yes, ma'am, you've been so patient. No, the one behind you has been had her hand up for a long time. Just behind you, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. How do we protect you and Chris? And yes. what are you doing yes. to make sure that yes. you get a chance to keep saying what you're saying? Two, what about state power? If we don't go for electing uh, candidates, if we don't find people to run, will the state not continue to reproduce this insanity? Where is the place for electoral politics? Right. Well, I'll answer that, that in reverse. I, I, just to clarify what I was saying, I, I was saying that I'm, I'm not here to give you an analysis about electoral politics or to tell you who to vote for. I, I, mean, I actually think that a lot of the problems in this country when it comes to our, our political system uh, stem from the fact that we have a, basically a one-party system, um, you know, which is which is largely a corporate system. And there are different. You will see, you know, differences on certain policies. But uh, on the premier issues, uh, there, there largely has been just a consensus among uh, the leading Democrats and Republicans. It's not true down at the rank and file level. There's amazing activists that are that are hardcore Democrats. So that's why I was I was trying to say that I understand that it's complex and that you know there's probably a bunch of people in this room that are very passionate. Um, about President Obama for, for reasons other than the things that I was uh, talking about. Um, and I, I'm not, what I'm saying is I'm not here to take on that debate. T to directly answer your question though, we need to get money out of politics and we need to break the duopoly. So, but in order to do that, you have to start at the local level. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, I, I think that people have blamed Ralph Nader for the 2000 election just repeatedly. And, and it's a position based on, on sheer ignorance. Um, going after Ralph Nader. Uh, this, my point isn't about Ralph, though. My point is that what Nader's campaign represented that year was an, was an idea. And the idea was, we need to break the two-party hold on power in this country. And the damage that was done because of the propaganda after that to, to third-party movements was so extreme that the only place to go is to start over at the local level. So I agree with what you're saying. Getting involved with school boards. You're talking about the school closures. Look at the war against teachers in this country right now. You know, we have to hold the line. Bill Moyers always talks about this, about PBS, how it just, it's getting worse and worse, but you have to hold the line with what little we have left of these institutions. So, and as far as the, the, the protection, I mean, I have my Blackwater's outside, and they're my guys. No, I'll just, I'll just, I have pink water security. Uh, I, I, you know, I think that a lot of you know, people who are in the public uh, eye are, are, um, are, are going after these policies, um, you know, are potential targets. And, and, and I don't think it's so much a potential target to, to have a, a, a suspicious accident on the road. I'm, I'm more concerned about being audited or, uh, you know, or, or having some kind of, you know, embarrassing emails that I'm sure I sent over the years, you know, being leaked online by some NSA person or whatever. No, they, people like this keep, keep us safe, you know, by, by, uh, by inviting us to do these things and making sure that, that uh, there's a collective group of people that believe in working on these issues. Okay. Update us shortly on Blackwater and who's paying yeah. directly for it. Uh, yeah, he was asking about an update on Blackwater. I'll, I'll do this very quickly. Um, Blackwater has gone through four name changes. Um, they, you know, they were U.S. Training Center. They were Z. Now they're Academy. Uh, Academy with an I. Um, the, the owner of Blackwater has fled the United States. He lives in Abu Dhabi. He's a Christian supremacist American nationalist who decided to go to the freedom-loving nation of Abu Dhabi, uh, where he lives under the protection of the Crown Prince and has set up another mercenary company um, called Reflex Response, and they've, they've been involved with Somalia and, and Libya. Um, so Blackwater Z Academy is currently working under the Obama administration as the premier security for the CIA. Uh, they also guard the U.S. ambassador in Afghanistan. Um, and they do a lot of work for multinational corporations. Um, the money comes from you if you pay your taxes. Um, 
you know, it's, it's paid either by the State Department um, through its aid budget, actually, uh, under diplomatic security, or it's paid out of the, the supplemental military funds or the overall military budget. Um, and you know, Blackwater now is small potatoes compared to some of the behemoths like Dine Corps and Armor Group. I mean, it's, it's, it's as radically privatized under President Obama as it was uh, under Bush. Look no further than the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, which is 80 football fields, the size of it. And Hillary, Secretary of State Clinton asked for an increase in the number of mercenaries to operate at the embassy. So the U.S. military is leaving and the State Department's increasing the number of of private security contractors, and that contract is up for bid right now, and Blackwater Z Academy is bidding on it. So How many students. people are involved in this? I mean, in, in Afghanistan, there's, it's basically now at a one-to-one -one ratio. Of, yeah. For every soldier, there's a, uh, you know, a private contractor. It could be someone who's a, a cook or, or a driver, or it could be an armed individual. So you know, in Afghanistan, there's probably between 25 and 30,000 mercenaries that are working in some capacity for the U.S. government. And then they exist elsewhere around the world. All of our embassy security is being outsourced, too. So we have paramilitary militaries around the world that are at our embassies and they're, they're private. Yeah, go ahead. Sir. I, I think uh, at um, this point, yeah. it, you know, something else is supposed to start in five minutes. So if people want to stay around and talk to... Well, I'm, I'm going to have to leave in a second anyway, so it's... Uh, so, yeah. I think, so let's take I, one more question. One more. Yeah, go ahead. Um, late at night on the BBC, I heard about the Barack Obama's secret prison buried under the ground in Somalia from Amnesty International. What I'd like to ask you is, for years and years, without a permission, have found that you spoke in twice, Chico, California, that's where I'm living yeah. now. Uh, I have been promoting with the Chico Peace and Justice Center that they put forward for um, Amy Goodman to run for president. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Okay, how many of you would vote for Amy Goodman if she were yeah. well, Why don't you promote her for president? Hey, listen, if you, if you want to start the committee to elect Amy Goodman, don't break into the Watergate and we'll be okay. Yeah, I can be the Secretary of State, I, I'm honored. Thank you guys very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jeremy. Jeremy. Jeremy.